good lesson there, established, built the stone monument, uh, saying, uh, don't build house below here. So maybe some of Taiwanese can read some Chinese letter. Uh, maybe this is the uh, lessons of the ancestor. So they follow the lessons of ancestor. So they rescue. Now I want to switch because of time. And many people uh, could be interested in the Fukushima nuclear power plant. This is a man-made disaster. Uh, you see, this is the, we had a very serious mistake. Uh, one mistake, the delay of the actor of pressure and uh, reduction of pressure and temperature. Uh, because the, uh, everything, uh, the system is automatic control, but all electricity done. They don't know how to make a manual operation. You see, too much modernized. So this took time. Uh, second mistake, uh, delay of pumping seawater for cooling down nuclear reactor. Tokyo electric power supply people said no, but everybody doubted they want to hesitate to stop. Because if you pump the uh, seawater into the reactor, they cannot reuse. So they hesitated. This is the doubt. Uh, anyhow, I want to show, trace the, uh, uh, a little the, uh, history. Uh, 2.46 on the 11th, the earthquake and tsunami happened. Uh, 12th, next day, 10 a.m. Pressure valves of so-called bent. It took five hours after Prime Minister's order. So late. Two reasons. One reason is the uh, delay and also electricity down. A second reason, it took time to evacuate the uh, residents within 10 kilometers. Because if you open the valve, so very dangerous, the uh, radioactive, contamination will happen. So we must evacuate the uh, village first uh, from the uh, outside of the 10 kilometer region. So it took time. Then uh, what happened? Uh, we had no water supply. The uh, fuel bar increased the temperature until 2,800 degree. Can you believe 2,800 degree? So, this is melt down, and then even melt through. So it generated the hydrogen gas. Then we had explosion uh, on the uh, 5 p.m. on the next day, number one reactor, and three days after, number three reactor also exploded. This is tremendously uh, dangerous because the air pollution then this is the, the picture of the, uh, not clear because the 20 kilometer distance video. So this is the, uh, then uh, what happened? Uh, the air uh, contamination is equivalent to 20 to 30 atomic bombs. So it's more than one atomic bomb of Hiroshima. So of course nobody died, but uh, this damaged huge area. Even Tokyo area, 250 kilometers, a few days after, we cannot drink the uh, water because some water for it. Now, okay. Air now getting down, but sea water very serious. So this is the four reactors there. One reactor number four was stopping. Only three reactor was operating, uh, but all stopped. And also uh, all uh, exploded except number two, but number two also have been uh, exploded a little bit. Just, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, this picture, this is hilly area, very close. We should be able to construct the emergency power supply, but why? This nuclear power station was designed by the American people. They targeted the tornado, which we don't have. 
Then they put the uh, emergency <coughs> generator under the ground to protect the tornado. They don't know tsunami. So that is why emergency, emergency power supply is located under the ground. The tsunami came in. So what happened? We had the hill, uh, high land here, just behind. But but Tokyo power supply could not escape. They know it's tsunami. So uh, you see, a few days after, this is very critical because if we leave high temperature and high pressure, another uh, accident happened. So military people and also firemen try to uh, provide the water, even from helicopter from the uh, fire station. But uh, this is protected gross, but not actually protected. Because a gamma ray or a beta ray, I'm sorry, beta ray, beta ray uh, penetrate such kind of cross. Only, you see, metal can stop it, concrete can stop it. And this is rather critical. This is the, uh, even now, the distribution of the contamination. Here is the Fukushima, this is 30 kilometers, this is 60 kilometers. This is wind driven. Wind blow normally in this direction. So even uh, outside of 30 kilometers, yellow color should evacuate. So uh, even 60 kilometers sometimes is a little bit critical. And then what happened for human health? We have a lot of standard. Uh, maybe you know the medical treatment, cancer treatment, CT scan is also highly Radiated. So normally, uh, per hour, uh, sieber, micro sieber, one micro sieber for the kid, five micro sieber for ordinary person is the standard choice uh, for to stop it. In total, one milli sieber will be the maximum. But if you get the CT scan, and also if you go uh, New York and Tokyo and Narita, it's also getting the more radiation, but it depends on the uh, person by person. Like a cigarette. Some smoker can survive 90 years old, but smoke, some smoker die on cancer on 40s, 50s. Same thing. So radioactive radiation is the influence very differently person by person. Uh, so, uh, what we learn, uh, nuclear power stations, no more sustainable. Even you cannot shut down, shut down. Not like a electricity switch. You cannot switch off. You must continue to cool down for 30 years. At least three years. Then you can take off the spent fuel bar and then bring to the France to reprocess. Japan cannot reprocess. But now we have a meltdown fuel. We cannot pull it out. So we have to continue to cool down for 30 years without reprocess. So it's really difficult and costly. So they, uh, Tokyo, the Japanese government say, OK, one kilowatt costs only five yen, a Japanese yen, for nuclear power. But if you calculate such kind of the compensation and cost for such kind of repair, it's going to be five years. So uh, this is the, uh, very critical. And government always the, uh, say the nuclear power station absolutely safe. But no, not absolutely safe. So many Japanese don't believe anymore the absolutely safe. So this is happening. Uh, what about the reconstruction, the plan? I want to show you only one case of the Onagawa town. Uh, this town also attacked very heavily uh, because of this all body until over here, attacked tsunami and here. But very luckily they have the hilly area near the coast. All sea coast area along the valley of coast attack. Uh, but uh, here was the uh, park the sports park, this is quite safe. 
And also, the, this is the uh, town, uh, townhouse was uh, heavily attacked. Uh, this the, uh, hospital attacked on the first floor. And then this middle school was saved. So even such a small town, <coughs> place by place, safe or not, and dangerous is different. So Onagawa City plan, make the plan of such kind of one. That uh, is plan. The yellow and orange color is a residential area and public facility. They decided to go up. They cut here to but This is already here. Move to the town over here. This is the fishing area, but they have to go between the here area and here. And the other area, commercial area, is the, uh, of course, risky, but they have an evacuation shelter. Um, so, so without such kind of plan, the town cannot get the uh, uh, governmental assistance. So they have to make the re-plan, but 50% uh, of town and cities cannot make the plan. Why? 20-30% uh, of staff die. So they have no expert of the uh, uh, administration. So that is the reason why they cannot make the plan, even now. So I want to conclude. The, uh, uh, Japan is a disaster-prone country. We have all variety of the disaster except tornado in the past. But now recently, because of climate change, we did have now a tornado several times in Japan. So we have all variety of the disasters. Uh, so catastrophic, uh, catastrophic disaster used to occur in each generation. Uh, of course, very serious one, uh, one time in 1,000, one time in 100, one time 10 years, depending on the type of the disaster. Uh, Japanese should prepare for those disasters, not based on hardware, but software. Maybe people say best mix with the best mix combination of hardware and software. We cannot magnify the hardware. We should have a minimum hardware, but of course software. But software, we did mistake. About 30, 40 percent of designated shelters uh, certified by local government were attacked by tsunami. This is little in the hazard map, hazard risk map. So we geospatial expert should be more responsible to designate more safe area according to the more past record and also learning the past experience. City planning after the earthquake and tsunami should be re reconsidered and well designed with proper countermeasures, such as setting on hilly area, or at least six floor concrete building. Five floor is not enough, because in this case, in Japan, the uh, fifth floor hospital was attacked. Only rooftop. But the rooftop is not enough because you must spend very cold night. And also building isolated. Next day, still the tsunami tide did not put down. All water surrounded the, uh, the building. So it isolated. So people on the roof were uh, rescued by helicopter in this time. So they are very cold. So that is why I said the six row, at least one from a safe. You can spend the night, cold night or any time uh, under the roof. What is more important? And maybe they should store some extra water bottle or some foods or some fuel. Otherwise, you cannot survive. Uh, Japan should not rely on nuclear power. This is my personal opinion. Maybe 70% of Japanese people say yes. Uh, so uh, about another 20, 30 people are uh, we need the power from nuclear uh, because of my business. But I don't know what is the decision of government. They are now considering the future energy policy. So you will know what happened for future Japan. Uh, 
Asaki very much for your attention. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining our session in such great numbers. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk about a new topic for me, the topic of uh, connecting uh, geomatics to smart cities. It's relatively new. As you have seen, I am the Department of Architecture, Institute of Conservation and Building Research. So I'm focusing now in my work on things like city modeling, things like cultural heritage, architecture, and so forth. Now, I would like to connect my presentation to what has been said in the opening session, and also by Shunji Murai. Shunji Murai showed us how devastating nature can be. The question is how devastating mankind can be. He showed us uh, devastating events happening within very short time, a few hours. The other events have it ha happening over a longer period, which might be as or even more devastating if we don't change. Uh, Professor Leo, in the opening session, posed the question, can mankind change nature? And he answered it with yes. The other question is, can mankind change itself? If we refer to Charles Darwin, and I would like to quote, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. So the question is, can mankind change? Uh, I think it has to, in order to be able to survive on the long term. Uh, what is geomatics? I, I brought this up because many of you are not uh, from the geomatics domain, but just a little bit of definition. It's a combination of different areas. It includes disciplines like geodesy, geodetic mensuration, photogrammetry, remote sensing, cartography, and geoinformatics. And most of us, when they talk about digital earth, refer to Al Gore's famous presentation 
in January 1998, I believe we need a digital Earth, a multi-resolution, three-dimensional representation of the planet into which we can embed vast quantities of georeference data. And in the meantime, we have a digital Earth Society, headquarters in Beijing. You all know about uh, Google Earth, Microsoft Virtual World, and more global, uh, uh, global uh, virtual worlds are building up uh, 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 in different countries. Now, let me talk about my key issue about cities, about smart cities, and the role of geomatics. And what is the problem? The problem is, as you all know, of course, for the first time in human history, more than half of the global population lives in urban area, areas. And uh, somebody tells me how which button to press. Yeah, I found it. Okay. And if you look at this figure, then you can see the urban population goes up. This is 2040 and rural population goes down at the same time. So this is a development which happens everywhere and particularly sharp in the developing world where cities gain an average of five million residents every month, every month worldwide. Only in the developing world, the cities gain five million residents. So, uh, how about harmony under these circumstances? Harmony among the spatial, social, economical, and environmental aspects of a city is very important. And this harmony hinges on three key pillars. There is the Earth environment. There is the economic development, which we shouldn't uh, leave out of consideration. And there is the social equity. And in order to achieve balance between these pillars, we have to look at sustainability, and Professor Leo has expressed this very clearly in his opening speech. And the role of geomatics was also addressed uh, by uh, Dr. Nayak uh, in his uh, uh, presentation about um, tsunami warning systems, for instance. So, uh, theoretically, cities can grow endlessly. There's no limit to the size of cities. But in practice, the growth is limited primarily by inability of man, inability to manage the size, because large urban centers are becoming more and more complex and more, more harder to manage. Uh, there's also mega events, which I would like to mention here, not only mega cities. And uh, what I have here is a presentation in German, Jagd auf weiße Elefanten. This is a hunt for white elephants. What does it mean? They don't mean the ISPS White Elephant Club. What they say is, uh, if you build an uh, Olympic stadium like the bird's nest, which by, by the way was built on, by one of my colleagues in, in our department, uh, how do you cope with it afterwards? How about sustainability? of these, uh, they, the architects call it now white elephants, because in our Western notation, a white elephant is something big, something useless, okay? So the hunt for white elephant, how can we build uh, sustainable um, uh, 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 buildings, large buildings that serve, like for Olympic Games or, or whatever, or football, a world championship, how can we build them such that they are sustainable? So the issue of, of mega is everywhere. Mega cities, mega events, and we are, we, are, we are hitting the same problems everywhere. So how about smart cities? Uh, there's one model which is called the six axis model of smart cities. Uh, the axis or dimensions, you could say, is economy, mobility, environment, people, living and governance. And everything has to be in balance here. Uh, everything has to be balanced out if you want to develop a, a city uh, in terms of smartness into the future. And I would like to quote here, because later on I come back to our project in Singapore, I would like to quote Singapore's finance minister, who at a meeting of the G7 and G20 group uh, uh, 
I mentioned the following, and I quote, but the challenge of providing reasonable, high-quality, high-density living, organizing cities so as to allow for economic innovation and growth is an immense challenge. And we can either succeed or fail, and we can easily fail if we don't go about this with sufficient pre-thought and planning. And he gets support by the previous uh, finance minister from Indonesia, and I quote, Singapore has become a leader among developing and developed countries, cities, in, in its effect efforts towards achieving economic growth and at the same time maintaining social harmony and environmental sustainability. Some people from Singapore may see it differently. You always have a look from inside and a look from outside, but the look from outside at least uh, looks uh, pretty good. Um, there's also a thing uh, like smart or spatial intelligence of cities. Spatial intelligence is obviously brings us closer to geomatics now. This refers to informational and cognitive processes such as information collection and processing, real-time alert, forecasting, learning, collective intelligence, distributed problem solving, and so forth. So this connects actually the problem of smart cities, the problem of intelligent cities to uh, geomatics and the emphasis on the, is on the terminology spatial or spatial dimension which is becoming very important. Now I talked about Singapore, about uh, uh, as a, Singapore as a, as a model city so to say for the future and there's a report that just came out uh, uh, commissioned by Siemens a company, Asian Green City Index. I don't know if you can read it, but the Asian major cities are classified with respect to their greenness and many other parameters. But if you just look at the issue of greenness, then Singapore sticks out as, as number one. And you can read other cities here. And there are other parameters also which have been analyzed. And in all cases, Singapore figures more or less on number one or number two. So from this point of view, at least, Singapore can be considered a model city. Now, uh, Singapore, however, uh, the people from Singapore may see it differently. They still think uh, we are not where we could be or should be. And there's an interministerial committee on sustainable development uh, which set some goals for the year 2030 uh, concerning energy, concerning waste, water, air quality, clean, blue and green environment, capability and expertise. This is something where we come in as university people, as researchers environment, uh, mental responsible community. Now they have defined clear goals, which I don't read here. They have quantified <coughs> what they want to achieve up to the year 2030. Now there's also in other cities, there are similar goals like Taipei seeks to make cities smarter with a new model of urban development and so forth. I'm not uh, going into detail here. The people from Taiwan know this probably Better. There's also business aspects in the future development of smart cities. Siemens, for instance, which has alone in Singapore five companies with 2,200 people, has set up a new division uh, which is called infrastructure products for mega cities. And the products are energy efficient buildings, modern power networks, modern traffic infrastructure, and alternative energies. So they are very much going into this area of, uh, of smart city, intelligent city, and they expect, of course, business from this area very clearly. So we also have in Singapore cooperation with, uh, with Siemens, for instance. So here's a list of geospatial technologies which uh, we can use and have to use in this context. I'm not reading it through. You are familiar with most of them. Uh, photogrammetry, remote sensing, of course, mapping, uh, mobile mapping, all plays a role. So there are a number of technologies from geomatics which play a role in investigations, in further development of smart cities. 
Now, Singapore government has set up recently what's called the CREATE program, Campus for Research Excellence and Technological Expertise. And so far, they have defined five research programs or research centers, and they are all in cooperation with other universities from other countries like MIT, Technion, Technical University of Munich, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and our school. And our school, uh, the project of our school, which spans over five years, is called SEC, SEC, FCL. FCL stands for Future Cities Laboratory, and it's driven by our Department of Architecture. But there are also people from civil engineering, transport, from mathematics, from electrical engineering, and so forth. But the driving force is the people, the colleagues from architecture, from city planning. So they are building, as I speak, uh, a new construction, a new building where we will move in probably in January. And, uh, but the project has already started. And we are considering a, a city as an urban metabolism, metabolism, metabolism like, like a human person. Okay? Uh, we understand the city as a dynamic system and we model, we read and model this system in terms of stock and flows. So simply said, stock describes the current situation, a static state and flows describe the changes over time or the processes that are currently going on in the city. So uh, my colleagues always operate with this terminology, stocks and flows. And as geomatics people, we have to get involved in stocks and flows. A city model would be the stock, okay? And the change or the updating of a city model would be the flow part of the business. Now, this is quite important. This describes our overall projects, stocks and flows of people, of energy, of water, of materials, of capital, of space, and of information. So these are our these are our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight modules, research modules on the project. And I myself, I work as a PI for the, for the information, the simulation platform, which is on the lower part. The simulation platform is a platform where all the data from the other modules are coming together and are being collected, analyzed, processed. Okay? So this simulation platform has different components, GIS software, visualization software, and so forth, and so forth. And we are defining three different scales in our work, the small lab, the medium lab, and the large lab. So large lab would relate to territorial scale, uh, small medium lab to urban design, or to, let's say, to a neighborhood, whereas the small lab would refer to individual house. i just give you an example, because we are also involved in other projects. So for instance, this is a hotel in Switzerland, a new one at 3,000 meter altitude. The Monte Rosa, uh, run by the Swiss Alpine Club, it accepts about more than 200 people per night, and it's 95% self-sufficient, 95% See, this is all uh, 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 sun panel, uh, sun panel. So it, it lives from sun energy, and all the, the waste, only five percent of the waste goes out. The waste that humans are producing, ninety-five percent is processed and reused internally. This is at three thousand meter, and if you come to Switzerland, I can recommend it to you, but not in winter time, because you have to walk there a long distance. And it's next to a glacier, as you can see. It's actually close to the winter because it's too harsh. But in summertime, it's it's really interesting thing. So this would be uh, an object of SLAB. Uh, we also work in Master City in Abu Dhabi. There's a part of Master City which is called Swiss Village. So this would be typically M scale. And a new town, a small town, is being built now, planned now, in Ethiopia which would uh, define the large lab case. So these are projects which are either finished already or ongoing, and they show the, the scale that we are involved in. 
And we are also involved not only in Singapore, but we are using data from other cities all over the world. Most of them are mega, it's very large cities, mega cities, as you can see here. <coughs> So, simulation platform, I think you all know what simulation is, but for, in order to do simulation, we have to get data, okay? So, data acquisition is very important, and simulations are being done in architecture, in urban planning, uh, for different purposes, different goals, and our visualization platform is called Value Lab Asia. This is an advanced interactive urban simulation environment which I will show you later, sorry. Um, the simulation platform itself has a number of jobs to do, like uh, generation of digital surface models uh, from different kind of data, uh, further development of techniques for uh, 3D city model generation, bring it to a higher level of automation, I mentioned the powerful visualization platform. We have already set up a GIS and we are working in research on 3D, 4D capabilities. The whole thing I should mention has, is not related to teaching really. This is all a research project for uh, ongoing for five years. So we have to investigate into change detection and the updating of uh, databases, we are working with reality-based data, but also with generic models. Uh, we have to handle dynamic and semantic aspects that leads to the notion of 4D city models. 4D denotes, the first dimension denotes a change over time or ongoing processes currently. People also look into uh, location-based services. Uh, and we have to define a uh, appropriate uh, set of applications for, for Singapore. And these are the, the working groups actually that are working currently uh, related to data acquisition, simulation, information modeling, interactive modeling, visualization. Uh, I myself involved I'm heading two of these working groups on the issue of generation of 3D, automated generation of 3D city models, and on the issue of 4D city models, how to update, how to update automatically uh, city models. And all of these, all of these working groups, if you have the time to read through, are somehow related to geomatics also. Geomatics has an input almost in all of them. Uh, this is a few on the, on the Asia Value Lab. As it is planned, it's currently being set up. It uh, contains 3 times 82 inches touch display wall, 4 times 50 inches mobile touch tables, and hopefully a system with either 3x3 three three or 4x4 four four video uh, systems, wall systems, possibly. I'm working on this issue. I have not convinced my colleagues yet that we need stereo display, but I hope I can. So this is a fairly large and expensive, you talk about one million US dollar for such a system. We have a similar system in Switzerland, so the plan is to connect both systems that we can work interactively in Switzerland as well as in Singapore. This is currently, as I speak, being set up in Singapore. Now, we are coming, we are getting concrete here. This is a list of requested data. The data that is requested from the other research modules. You remember the stock and flow modules that I've mentioned before. They need all this data. Again, I'm not going through it. Uh, some of the data is available already. Some of the data you can get in Singapore. Some of the data you have to buy. Uh, lots of the data we will have to generate uh, ourselves. Okay, so this is geomatics data. I think I skip, I skip about this one about reality-based modeling for emergency management because once you have this data, like 3D city models, uh, very precise digital terrain model, then you can start modeling, you can start doing simulations Shin Morai, Morai has shown the case of tsunami, earthquake and tsunami. Uh, 
I don't know if there was any modeling before of, of possible events in Japan. And in 3D computer modeling, yes, they did it, okay, but it didn't help because the assumption was not sufficient, right? Okay, so uh, this data can be used for, for modeling, but I, I skip over it because Professor Murai has addressed the issue of natural disaster. <coughs> we all know what has happened lately in the past few years in many, many parts of the world and how important a geomatic data has become in form of satellite images, for instance, in form of aerial images. This is also quite interesting, a tornado in Oklahoma. You see the path of the tornado is shown in an aerial image, very, or satellite image even here, very precisely, very sharp. I was surprised to see that a tornado leaves such a sharp path with very sharp borders. This is a magnification to destruction here. So you are all familiar with this kind of imagery, so I would like to skip over it. And uh, just would like to mention that we are dealing with models here, we are dealing with 3D models, and most of us are concerned with geometry, but uh, with geometry only. But I would like to remind you that if you put it on a GIS, topology is as important. Uh, semantics is becoming more and more important. When I, when I talk to my colleagues from city planning and architecture, they are not so much interested in geometry. Semantics is much more important for them. Semantics, uh, how many people are living in a house? Uh, what, what are the number of rooms? What is the material that the house is built from? Uh, how old is it? Uh, what, what is it, the price of the house, the value of the and, and so forth. So these are all things we have to be, or we better should be concerned as well. And appearance is a new terminology for texture. Okay, they call it appearance. And of course, with texture, you can, you can, do, you can create a lot of problems. So uh, these models are used for the analysis of life cycles of building stocks and flows. So we know all the imaging platforms from satellites, uh, aerial <coughs> images going down to uh, uh, model helicopters, for instance, UAVs and terrestrial images. And in summary, uh, I would like to say about satellite images, uh, we can nowadays georeference satellite images consistently with subpixel accuracy in planimetry and height. So the georeferencing to me is not a problem really anymore. Okay? This is a solved problem and we have shown this with many, many different sensors. Uh, producing digital terrain models, uh, we are somewhere between, uh, when we do it fully automatically, we are somewhere between one and five pixels, depending on factors like terrain, land use, image texture, and image quality. These are the good news, but the bad news is still that the availability is very often not good, sometimes because of cloud coverage. Uh, here's the hope for improved availability in the future. The costs are still high, sometimes too high. We hope for lower costs in the, in the future. And uh, of big concern is sometimes the low image quality as we see it, or have seen it like with Arlos Prism, for instance, uh, coming from calibration problems, timing, weather, atmospheric effects, clouds. And also good commercial software, especially for image matching and object extraction is still, still lacking. We have for georeferencing, but not for the other tasks. So, uh, okay. This is just an example that shows you, that visualizes you one of my statements about image quality. We have here our campus in Switzerland from an aerial image down sampled to 2.5 meter. The same pixel size as a prism image, and you can appreciate and see the difference in quality right away. So, basing a decision about a, a satellite image on pixel size is not sufficient. Pixel size should not be the sole parameter, because here again, we have the same pixel size, but much difference in quality. 
So use MTF, for instance. If you use MTF function, then you get a better idea about the image quality. Pixel size is not sufficient. I have an example from Singapore about georeferencing, where we work now with satellite images in two areas of, of Bungol and Little India and Keelong. And we have used WB2, uh, Iconos, uh, Iconos and WB2 stereo images. And uh, we have used RBFs, uh, uh, racial polynomial functions. Now, if we only use RPCs, we end up in this case in Bungol with about three meter or four, four meter accuracy, which is not enough for us. Now, if we do RPCs with uh, bias correction using only one control point, then it drops down to subpixel accuracy to O point to these values, okay, which are uh, uh, subpixel or one pixel subpixel accuracy. And the same happens with Iconos images in the area of Little India, Geelong, for instance. We start without any corrections, just using RPCs at a level of up to 5 meter. Uh, and then this drops down to 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.6 meter. So again, subpixel accuracy. This is something which we experience all the time with all the sensors, all the satellite images that we are using consistently. Okay, RPCs are usually not sufficient. You have to use them in a bias correction, corrected form, or you have to use a strict model. Now, satellite images from space. Here is something which worries me about DSM generation. I said before, in many, many tests, we have achieved an accuracy of one to five pixels uh, in DSM generation. Now these are three test areas in Switzerland where we have used uh, prism, prism stereo data and we have, com we have run an image matcher and we have compared it with reference data, high accuracy. And these are the error distributions. They look beautiful. Gaussian distribution with a very high peak. Every data set includes a few million points, so a lot of, a lot of points, statistically relevant beautifully all centered around zero, but what you don't see very clear is they also have long tails, which means large errors going up to 60 meter, pixel size 2.5 meter. And this is what worries us, okay? The system or the algorithm, I should say, behaves well in most of the points, but there are always a few blunders and also systematic errors that, that are a reason to worry, and we have to get rid of those, okay? How we do it is a detailed technical problem that I cannot explain fully. Or another case with Cartosat data over the city of Rome, where we did the same. We had a reference DSM from lasers, area laser scanning, and we compared the result of the measure finally with a reference DSM, and this is a color-coded picture of the residuals, of the errors. And you see clearly a systematic pattern, okay? You see the roads in Rome clearly showing up systematically because what, what's happening is the roads are being filled or partially filled because of occlusion or semi-occlusions. So this is not really the result of matching errors. The points themselves may be correct, but interpolation errors. You don't get down to the foot point of a house, to the intersection of the wall with a road. So you, if you model the surface, you will generate an error. So many of these errors are really interpolation errors and not, uh, not uh, matching errors. But they are part of the digital terrain model. So this is something we have to uh, Right. Now we can also produce city models, of course, from uh, satellite images. Here's an example of Phoenix, Arizona. In this case, of course, the texture on the wall is generic, is synthetic. Now when we use aerial images, we have many choices, not only using cameras, but also laser scans, radar, INSA, and so forth. A very interesting trend here is, of course, the use of multiple camera heads, like pictometry is using. Um, Singapore, by the way, has also been flown with such a system 
but for security reasons we do not get access to this kind of imagery, unfortunately. We can use this aerial data to produce digital terrain models, uh, <coughs> digital surface models in a city. This is not the result of a laser scan, but it looks the same or similar. This is a result of the image nature using Wechsel Ultra Gamma over the city of Graz. And if you go into detail, you find out that uh, the image nature behaves better than the laser scanner along edges, okay? Houses are built up by edges. Why? Because the edges are directly matched. Laser scan, you will miss the edges, most probably. So you have to interpolate the edges. So uh, generally, photogrammetry is better on edges, while laser scanning is better on soft surfaces. If I may simplify it a little bit, the problem, okay? Uh, then uh, we have semi-automated techniques to generate city models. And very useful is, of course, this uh, oblique imagery, imagery. We are using, we have used in the past, the uh, vertical images for to extract the geometry and the oblique image is mainly for texture. So this is, for instance, an example from London, city model of London, where we use pictometry images, and we overlay the geometrical model with the oblique images, and there will be a different difference, of course, because georeferencing originally is not very accurate, and we do the correction then, and we, we, we put the texture on the model and texture that comes from oblique images. Now you can use approaches for uh, geometric approaches for, for uh, very much detailed buildings like they are used in car navigation, 3D landmarks for car navigation, 